The COB is brought to you by Pepperstone, trusted by traders in over 160 countries. From Barangaroo Studios, here's what you need to know about the day in business and finance. Welcome to the COB. I'm Juliette Sarley. What day is it? It's Wednesday, I think, halfway through the week. Um, a little bit of a better day than yesterday, but still nothing to write home about. You're not going to get out um, your postcard and write too much about today's market action. We did have the GDP figures coming through at 11.30. You can see a little bit of a spike coming through um, from there. Um, so we've closed high by about two tenths of 1%. On the ASX 200, I think we're up by about a third of 1%, so slightly better, 7,757. It really has been um, some big movements coming through from the likes of CSL and some of the other healthcare players. We mentioned Fisher Paykel earlier in the week. It was up another 4% today. And the likes of CBA and some of the um, REITs doing well today that has offset some of the moves that we saw in terms of the miners. So let's get to the three themes, because certainly healthy gains when you look at the overall healthcare sector looking really good. Iron ore crash, though, we're continuing to monitor the move in this commodity. I was just talking to um, Mabrook Shetuan from Natixis Asset Management about the overall impact of the Chinese economy. And iron ore futures actually hit their lowest level in seven weeks. You've got these high port side inventories and weak demand from China really weighing on um, the overall commodity and got a lot of analysts scrambling to uh, change their forecast for the commodity. I did make the point yesterday, we had this around this time last year, everybody calling for sort of a bear market for the commodity and then it continued to ratchet higher. So everything of course always needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but today certainly we did see some weakness coming through in these iron ore players. Fortescue off by 1.4%, BHP down 1.5%. And snail's pace, I mean that GDP print, could it be even more of a crawl, just 0.1 of 1% growth in the Australian economy? A really interesting conversation with Damien Hennessy from Zenith Investment a little earlier saying that um, you know, when we do see the wages increase for those lower paid workers and we see the tax cuts for all of us and we see the energy rebates for all of us, that's probably not likely to stoke inflation. We're not going to be out there splashing cash. We're just going to be trying to pay those bills. We're just going to try and keep ahead. So he actually thinks it's going to even out and that the likelihood, albeit small, is still more of a rate hike than a rate cut. Let's have a quick look at some of the sectors talking about healthcare and some of the good gains that we saw coming through there, including the likes of CSL and Cochlear. Cochlear up by some 2%. Energy also looking good. Um, global oil prices, or actually it was not looking good, global oil prices falling to its lowest level in four months overnight. Also a quick look at those miners on that iron ore move. Um, you've got Rio down 2%, Fortescue off 1.5%. And having a look at some of the stock-specific corporate news, Treasury Wine Estates, an impressive 5.4% gain. It reaffirmed its forecast ahead of an investor day in the US. Medibank in the Federal Court of Australia relating to the health insurer's 2022 cyber attack stands accused of failing to protect customers' data. Immutep's $100 million capital raise earlier this week put pressure on the company's shares. Seek shares tracked higher after the firm agreed to sell its majority stake in OCC Mexico. And we saw zero our stock of the day moving lower after it priced uh, $925 million in convertible notes. Let's get to our guest, Mark Gardner from MPC Market. So snail's pace, not much happening at all in the economy. No, not at all. Um, I mean, what is it, a 0.1 uh, gain? Yeah. So um, that does, I mean, that's probably relief for the government, um, obviously given they've given tax cuts and... Um, a few fairly stimulatory, um, you know, policies uh, out of the budget. So, you know, that um, that will kind of make up um, for a little bit of that, I suppose. Um, I think the real, what was really uh, obvious on screen today was just, it was a very big shift out of cyclicals into non-cyclicals. Um, obviously, the miners getting hit. Um, the iron ore move, I'm kind of wondering why people are so surprised when they've been calling iron ore is for being too elevated for months and months now. But... Um, I think they shift back to, I mean, you even saw the likes of Grain Corp up about 3 yeah. or 4% today. Like, um, there was, you know, there, there was some pretty positive moves in the likes of defensive things like Telstra and Transurban and um, some of the communication stocks and, mm. and obviously healthcare being one of the bigger um, non-cyclical uh, sectors as well. So that probably tells me there's a little bit of a risk off. Um, and, you know, and given that bond yields have fallen back so hard since the... Um, you know, the ISM numbers earlier in the week. Yeah. Um, you know, normally we would have an, just an unbridled rally lately. I think it's starting to, investors, it's starting to sink in that the, 
you know, global economy is slowing yeah. and, um, you know, rate cuts is not necessarily a good thing. So uh, be interested to see how this plays out. But um, healthcare is definitely one of those sectors I think you can, you know, you can still probably hide. Um, well, they don't against... call it the defensive sector for nothing, do they? No. Um, let's talk about some of the moves in this likes of Treasury Wine Estates. We talked about that. It's got a shareholder meeting up by about 6%. But this is really interesting on the back of those tariffs being rolled back as well from China. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's that's an added, almost an added bonus. Mm. Tre- Treasury Wines, you know, obviously that the, when the tariff came in, that was really... It was horrible for the company. They've gone away, they've reinvented themselves. Um, this winery they've got in the US is, they're looking at expanding it, that premium um, it, uh, that premium wine sort of around about the $100 mark where they had a real big, uh, they had a, a very large gap in their range. Um, they're looking at expanding that and, um, and capitalising on that business. Um, uh, in, I think it meant in the California, I think Napa Valley. So, um, so yeah, the investor presentation was, was super positive and they've reaffirmed guidance and I think we, we were we bought some treasury wines we sold um, I don't know, I think around about the $13 mark but we were just a little bit concerned around how this acquisition would you know it was 1.6 odd billion dollars it's mm. not wasn't exactly small fry yeah um, but I think that's just reignited investor confidence that the company's going in the right direction and then add to that as well that we can Obviously now sell back, you know, those premium red cap uh, Penfolds wines back into, yeah. uh, into China. So, um, you know, they, it's almost the best of both worlds. And whilst it's probably been a pretty painful three or four years for shareholders, um, I think overall I'd be much happier shareholder of Treasury Wines now than what I, I would have been when it was much higher three, three odd years ago. Yeah, interesting. All right. Um, let's talk about the US. You touched on it briefly there, but that ISM data that we have seen coming through, I mean, it is starting to see that that economy is in a descent. When do we see the rate cuts? Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily know. I, I still think that we're waiting until the end of the year. Um, the Fed's, I mean, you know, we don't want to say stagflation. Stagflation is very rare mm. and it's a disaster for equity markets. But, um, you know, I I still think they're a little bit snookered in terms of cutting rates until inflation starts to actually significantly come down. Um, So I think higher for long is probably going to be for, you know, at least maybe the next five or six months. Mm. Um, But what we're going to remember as well is when, obviously, when employment markets uh, or labour labour markets turn, they, like, they turn nasty very fast. So... I think the payrolls number that's coming out at the end of the week is going to be pretty key. And they're still expecting yeah. up 185,000. Well, what about um, that jolt starter? I mean, that sort of jolts, showed us that, yeah. you know, job openings falling somewhat. But, you know, the long-term historical average is still four or five million. Yeah. So it, that's been high, that's been extremely elevated for a long period of time. That's been a long time coming. But um, you know, that was the lowest print um, in three years. And... Um, you know, if that starts to filter through in, in payrolls numbers as well, um, you know, that, that streak of, uh, of consecutive gains since 2020, late 2020 in the payrolls numbers may be under threat. Mm. All right. Always a pleasure. Thank you so Cheers. much, Mark Gardner from MPC Markets. And then, of course, we were talking about our stock of the day being zero. Michael Wayne from Medallion Financial and Philip Pepe from Sure and Partners shared their take with Koshi on the call. Stock that probably never looks cheap at almost 60 times PE. It's uh, eye-watering. Um, but on consensus estimates, it is cheap. The consensus target price is about $155 per share. So if you believe yeah. that, there's around a 20% upside. So back to those five-year highs. Yeah, the back to the five-year highs. And yep. it's covered by a lot of stocks. So consider that a pretty much well-informed consensus. It's probably one where you just close your eyes at the PE. It's only one metric people look at in terms of investment. It's a quality company, uh, good opportunity today to buy on a pullback. Um, long-term growth company, oh, yeah, I'd call it a buy. Not and free cash flow positive and profitable um, around the, you know, the time that they indicated. So it's been proven to be a well-run business. The reason we got out, we were just starting to get a little bit nervous around their, their growth in the UK and the US and sort of what sort of margins that they were attaining from those businesses. And that's what kind of spooked us a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's a very high quality business. And if it, it, its most recent update was very good. So mm. if we can continue to deliver those sorts of numbers, it's definitely one we'll look at.
right, the day's trade has ended. Taking a look at the market leaders, we just touched on Treasury Wine Estates and Mark, of course, saying he'd rather hold it here than where it was three years ago. Seek, that was another really interesting story today, which um, is why its share price moved. It agreed to sell its majority stake in OCC Mexico and its 100% interest in Cafo Online, which are two Latin American employment markets. Uh, Promedicus also looking good. Fisher and Piker were talking about that healthy rally in the healthcare space. To the downside today, um, let's have a look at the laggards. Certainly a lot of uh, weakness coming through in some of those iron ore players. We touched on the zero story as well, off by 5%. Alumina, that's quite interesting, but um, we did see a small dip in aluminium futures on the LME overnight. Let's have a look at uh, what we're seeing in terms of the small end of town. Cyclo Farm there up by 17%. I remember seeing a press release in my inbox about Cyclo Farm. I'm not sure if I'm going to be fast enough to find out what the news was there, but it was a good run today. Bubs, Aravella Therapeutic, One View Healthcare, Catapults. Remember we spoke to the CEO um, last week and then I was speaking to uh, I think it was Stephen Johnson from Forager Funds yesterday who was saying that he quite likes that stock as well. All right, let's have a look at some of the losers in the small end of town or the laggards, as I'm supposed to say. Ionia, uh, Aurelia Metals, Raiden Resources, Elevate Uranium and WIA Gold. And taking a look as well in terms of what we've got tonight, a lot on the PMI space, just giving a broader view as Mabrook Shadowan was telling me from the Texas about the overall health of the economy, including Eurozone and UK PMIs. Um, I don't think that we have non-farm payrolls. That's always a Friday, so we won't be having that. But uh, the Bank of Canada coming through with a policy statement and also services PMI. So that is actually meant to be the US ADP employment change, not the non-farm payrolls. All right, flipping the board and having a look at um, tomorrow, we get home loan approvals and a trade balance and also a couple of AGMs coming through as well, including Coronado Global Resource and Light and Wonder. All right, a quick check on terms of where the market is. We have closed out the day's trade on a slightly positive note. Um, two tenths of 1% there on the SIBO 200. When it comes to the ASX 200, up 22 points of 31%, 7,759 points. All right, what will tomorrow bring um, as we look at those lending indicators for April and the international goods trade for April as well? Another trading day to get you across. We're live from 9.45 Eastern. Have a good evening. The COB is brought to you by Pepperstone, trusted by traders in over 160 countries. Gil. Oh, hey, Ken. Here we go. You still trading? Pepperstone. Bye. Trusted in over 160 countries, you? Well, I'm still with I don't think anyone trusts them. No, I'm fine with it. Just like I'm fine with my trusty coach, 1980s John McEnroe. Pathetic! Horrible! 1980s, huh? So, really temperamental? Keeps me on my toes. Awful! It's a bit intense. Be better! You're still fine with it. Use your racket! He's just staring at us. Yeah, sometimes he yells and then sometimes he just stares. Is he aiming for your face, Gil? He's fine with it! Yeah, he's definitely trying to hit you. Uh, fine with uh, it. Don't be fine with it. Switch to Pepperstone, trusted by traders in over 160 countries. Come on, you cannot be serious! Don't do that. Ow.